welcome to the show Girl, let's talk. My name is Nonshantla Mabigwa, and today on the show, we're going to be talking about mining and, put, and putting women and young people at the center of our uh, discussion. And I'm joined by Nobuhle Chikuni, who is the programs officer at Zela, Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association. Hello, and welcome to the program. Hi, Nonshantla. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Now, before we get deeper into the issues of mining, let's talk about the participation of women in mining. <sighs> okay. So generally, the mining sector is male-dominated, um, whether it's at artisanal small-scale mining level or large-scale mining. But we won't say women are not participating. Um, in the recent years, there's been an increase in the women who join mining um, because the economy has pushed them there. Um, they, they can get money and sustain their families. And you find that because of climate change, the erratic rainfalls and the changes, women who used to rely mostly on agriculture do not rely on it anymore. They now need to diversify and the next best thing that they can go for is mining. So we do have women joining the mining sector. We do have women participating, but their participation is limited. And there are so many barriers that make it hard for them to actively participate and benefit compared to their male counterparts, be it at artisanal and small scale level or at large scale level. So we do have, but their participation is limited. And uh, what is limiting their participation? What are these challenges? Yeah, well, that's, that's a very big one. But for starters, everyone knows how labor intensive the mining sector is. And women struggle with financing um, their activities in the mining sector. When it comes to getting loans, the collateral that's required from the different finance institutions women don't have. So for example, land can be used as a collateral, but as we know, women do not have the same opportunities or access to land as compared to male, to their male counterparts. So that affects um, their participation one in terms of me mechanization, in terms of getting the licenses that are required, and even in terms of financing their operations, paying the workers, and buying the equipment, the financing part is a very huge component. We also have technical knowledge. Women have very limited technical knowledge when it comes to mining. For some reason, for men, it's easy for them to quickly grasp those technical concepts that are required, but women don't have them. And it's also easy for men to apply technical concepts, but because of the nature of the sector, the going into the pit, it limits women to, to be able to do that. So the issue of technical capacity is a challenge. Then we also have the issue of gender-based violence, where in areas where we work in, you'll find that it's rare to find a married woman in the sector because there's no men who allow their wives to go and work there because of the assumption of what happens. The sector is very intensive and there's a lot of security included. Where in some areas we have women who sleep there to safeguard their all mm -hmm. and no men would allow their wife to go through that. Mm -hmm. In cases where we have married women actively participating, their spouse is equally involved in mining. Um, we also talk about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. Men sexually harass women a lot. There's also physical abuse where women are abused by their male counterparts. Then there's the issue of verbal abuse mm -hmm. um, where in some areas, if a woman is seen walking in a mine, the name calling starts and they're given all these names that can be degrading to the women. We also have the issue of, um, in 2019, 
uh, there was this big wave of machete violence where most of the women miners were left vulnerable. Some of them actually had to stop operations because they were the easy targets. Mm -hmm. The machete gangs would either attack them or the workers that work for them. And were very sad stories where people died or the women lost their workers who were murdered by these. And that still falls under issues of gender-based um, violence. Then it comes to the issues of lack of equipment. Um, this one might be linked to the issue of financing. But women in mining struggle with getting the appropriate equipment that they need to carry out uh, their activities. Women also cite um, access to mining claims. Um, so all along Zimbabwe has been using an archaic mining allocation system where it has been manual, it hasn't been computerized, and you'd find instances where she's successfully secured a claim, but because of the manual system that is being used, or was being used rather, there is double pegging. So you then have another man coming and saying, this is mine, and honestly, she doesn't have the energy or the resources to compete or go against him. So that as well has affected women. And many women also mention the issue of proximity of mining offices. They need to travel long distances to be able to go to those offices, um, verify their claims, get the required licenses. So yeah, those are the challenges that, that women face. And this is all in addition of the unpaid care work, the burden of unpaid care work, where a typical woman will have to wake up very early, make sure the house is clean, the children are taken care of, food is prepared, before they then proceed and go to the mine. And they still need to come back in time for when schools have, the children have come back to school, they make sure the children have been fed, the children have been taken care of, and other duties associated uh, with the women in the home. So it's really not easy for the women to get into that sector. Uh, but we're not saying it's impossible because they are women who have been able to be in the sector. And those women have been very inspirational. Those women have been able to drive change with the little that they are making as compared to their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. From the work we've been doing for the past 20 years plus and research as well backs it, women we've worked with and we've supported have proved to be more sustainable than their male counterparts. Um, they look at the bigger picture when it comes to the funds that they've made. They try to invest in the home and they also invest in the community so we have groups of women who, from the skills that they've been able to acquire and the resources that they've been able to get, they've gone further to make sure that they empower the youths in their area. They've gone further to make sure that, for example, we are students uh, with technical institutions who are doing mining engineering. They offer them an opportunity to come and learn because those students as well also face a challenge. They're actually large-scale mining companies who will tell you we do not employ women. This environment is for not for a woman. Mm -hmm. But she has the same qualifications as her male counterparts and probably better mm -hmm. than him. But they just won't take her. So the small-scale um, women in the small-scale mining sector have been able to open up and bring those children on board and for them that also helps um, address the issue of technical capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, quite interesting uh, to hear that. Now, let's talk about physically and you know in mining there are chemicals, there's all that. What have been the challenges uh, when it comes to women? So, so physically, women, we cannot go into the pit to do mining, but surely there are things that we can do above ground uh, that contribute to the extraction process. 
Um, and in many cases, women are involved in the process where they can use mercury um, to extract the gold. But that has a lot of challenges and is not encouraged. Research has shown that the use of mercury has huge impacts on the sexual reproductive, reproductive health of women. Um, it can affect their reproduction. If a woman is pregnant, the fetus can equally be affected. And in many of these areas, women are using mercury as if it's, it's cooking oil in the home. There are no safety precautions taken um, and even disposal. It's just become so normal using mercury and it's not supposed to be. And mercury also has impacts on the environment. Um, it doesn't only affect the immediate user who is the miner, but it will also affect the host communities. So we have research and evidence of mercury having an impact on aquatic life, which we also then go and buy and eat. So the mercury in there is then taken by people who are not necessarily involved in mining. And then we, yeah, so there's the issue of mercury, uh, the equipment used, but there's also an interesting myth that is there in the mining sector where they believe when a woman is going through her monthly menses, she can be seen at a mining sector because the gold will disappear. So you have mine, mine, mine owners as well, not employing women because of that. So I won't say women, some of them are very daring. You do have some who are daring and try to go down there, but our f physical buildup, unfortunately, does not allow women to do that. But it doesn't mean the stuff that women cannot do above ground to contribute. Uh, we have women who use equipment like the bore mills, um, they, they still contribute to the processing. It might not be as same as men, but there is something for them to do and not just limited to the sweeping and cooking around the mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, this issue of uh, women and their menses. In some churches, they are, you know, they are considered uh, dirty. They can't be seen at the altar. Now in the mining sector, we make the gold disappear. Well, yeah, uh, that's quite something else there. But now, after all these challenges have been brought up, um, let's maybe start off with the mining companies themselves. What are they doing to address all these challenges that you have spoken about? So there are a couple mining companies that we know of that um, offer EPOs. So this is an arrangement where they have space that they are not using for mining and they can say, women, here is something you can use for that. And we, while is there are some who tell you we don't want women, we don't employ women, it's not every mining company. Some genuinely do employ women and there are some who are providing technical capacity to women's syndicates so it's technical capacity it could be in theory um, where they, they train them and it's also a technical capacity it could be practical where they allow the women to either come and see their operations or have their gold processed on um, their operations so there are some mining companies that are doing something, but there are also some that are doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But there's still room for improvement yeah. either way. And uh, looking maybe in terms of uh, policy and what the government is doing in terms of addressing uh, these challenges. So when it comes to financing, um, the government established what is called the Women's Bank. Uh, there have been funds that have been availed but when we do our surveys, the uptake of that fund has been limited. Mm -hmm. It could be an issue of information dissemination when you have a woman who's in deep, deep, deep um, Manika land, Ada Transau down there, who wants to get financing but has no information. Mm -hmm. So it's the issue of information dissemination that needs to be addressed. 
And then there's been other funds that have been availed by Fidelity Printers and Refineries for women miners to come and get. But again, the issue of access to information. So you go to area and women will tell you, uh, this is the first time we're hearing about it and this was probably launched three, four, five months ago. So that still needs to be addressed, the mode of information dissemination and the targeting when it comes to making sure that the women get those grants. Um, then there's the issue where when we discuss and we discuss with women where there might be a need to set up a quota system where we have something similar in wildlife where we have a quota system that is set every year permitting communities to benefit but maybe something similar should be done for mining women in mining they set up a quota of how much women can get that uh, the government is currently in the process of finalizing the mines and minerals amendment bill and there's a need to quickly push and make sure that is finalized and passed into law by parliament why because then it then gives some form of formalization to the artisanal and small scale mining sector. And with that in line with our mantra of being open for business and uh, pushing for Vision 2030, when the sector is formalized, it's easier for other donors or sponsors to come in and try to support women. It's also easier to support women when they are formalized because there's some form of organization. Mm -hmm. There currently is, but surely more can be done. And it also makes it easier for CSOs to work around that formalization and identify gaps and also avoid working in silos when we're working towards the same goal of empowering women. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier on you touched on one sensitive issue, issues of the issues of gender-based violence and sexual harassment. What is being done about that as well? So I know <clears throat> the government and organizations like Musasa have set up uh, one-stop gender houses where women can go there. But then the problem is with our women as well because of the power imbalances that are there, you're probably being abused by a mine owner, or you're probably being abused by someone who was offering you technical um, help on your mine, and you have no interest whatsoever in feathering, or you cannot go to school and get that. Women are then left vulnerable to those men that have the upper hand and have more power than them <clears throat> but there are organizations that have been working on issues to do with gbv mm -hmm. in the asm sector and organizations like zela we also do research that we then use uh, for advocacy and lobbying for engagement with uh, stakeholders like parliament and the ministry so a good example is when we had the machete gangs affecting the women we worked with the women to come up with um, a petition that they submitted to parliament and our by then portfolio committee of mines and energy was very responsive and they actually launched investigations and I can safely say there have been less reports. They didn't stop but they are definitely less than what they were then. What I've noticed is what slows down some response mechanisms to issues is how the information is delivered and shared with the relevant people. It's different when you just make noise without specific targeting. Um, in the Machet Gang case, I think the targeting uh, was very appropriate and it made the response very effective and something was done. So yes, there are organizations working on GBV uh, offering counseling, psychological support, and some even offer health services. But then again, women sometimes don't speak up out of fear of uh, discrimination or being labeled or not being able to continue getting the support that their male counterparts were offering them. 
before when they were then violating them. But again, there's definitely scope for more improvement to make sure that reduces. But what has also been disturbing, especially during the COVID era, is how we notice the increase in um, children in the mining sector. Um, because the children they were not going to school, many parents were not going to school, um, the children were then forced to go into the sector to help support the family or raise school fees uh, for themselves. Um, in some areas that we went to when we we're doing a survey, you'll find a 15-year-old. She's pregnant. She already has another child. And she's telling you, I'm mining. Um, they'll be doing alluvial mining. I'm mining um, to make money to support my family and my children. Uh, she either was sexually abused by her minors, that's why she's pregnant. The father of the first child, because of the nomadic nature of the sector, moved away. She's pregnant. She doesn't know where the father is. He moved away. So I'm mining to support my family. But over and above, I want to go back to school mm -hmm. and maybe do nursing or be a teacher. So that also brings a different aspect on how it also affects women. You can separate women and children, mm -hmm. but then that has been happening. So we have also been pushing for the reduction of women, children mm -hmm. in the mining sector, because even at a global scale, when you look at issues of responsible sourcing and responsible mining, having children working in the mining sector is not um, recommendable and we're trying to stop that. So, yeah, more can be done. Yeah. Taking on from that, more can be done. What more should be done? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll speak to work that is being done by organizations like SELA. So we identified the gaps and we've been able to uh, facilitate capacity building sessions for women. Funds permitting, we've been able to support women to enroll with the Zimbabwe School of Mines uh, to get their technical diplomas in mining, technical diplomas in mining and engineering. We have also been able to provide equipment for women in mining. We also train them on the laws to help them comply with the laws. We also train them on environmental management, um, environmental rehabilitation. We are also training on them on issues to do with safety and health and the reduction of mercury use as well is something that we are working on. We also try to link women with other players in the sector. It could be large-scale miners. It could be potential donors who want to fund women-led projects. It could also be government um, ministries, relevant ministries, parliament. So we, we have been doing that, but we still want to scale up um, and make sure our coverage is more. So we were focusing on gold and gemstone, but there's so much artisanal mining being done for other minerals in Zimbabwe, and we're working on scaling up that. We also have a flagship program that actually ended um, yesterday, the Zimbabwe Alternative Mining Endeavor. It's a forum where deep miners, including women, come and interface with parliament, with ministries, with mining companies. And that's also a platform where people can, women can push for their issues of inclusion, issues of financial support. So those are one of the forums that we facilitate to make sure that women are at the forefront of pushing for changes and inclusion of women in the mining sector. And um, definitely there are many more organizations that are doing work similar to Zela as well. 
Wow. Oh. I've learned a lot today and uh, quite interesting as well what is happening in the mining sector. Now maybe as we wrap up the show, maybe tell us a bit more about Zela besides what you've uh, maybe spoken about. What else does Zela do? Uh, so Zela is a premier public interest um, organization. We want to see communities living in natural resource rich areas benefiting from those natural resources in a sustainable manner. So we have five thematic programming areas. We'll focus on extractives, where we are working with large-scale mines, artisanal and small-scale miners, looking at mineral extraction, oil and gas. We also have a thematic area, climate change and energy where we program on climate change, adaption, laws and policies, and of course, women as well. We also have um, our Lens and Natural Resources program. It focuses on wildlife, forestry, agriculture, land, water, anything to do with land and natural resources. Where of late, when it comes to wildlife, we've been looking at issues of human and wildlife conflict, uh, wildlife management, water management, forest management, uh, farmers' rights, agriculture and land as well. We have um, a program on local service delivery where we are saying we get, res we get funds or revenue from natural resources. How are those funds being channeled to support the communities and make sure there is proper service delivery? And then we have um, responsible investments and business where we are talking about, yes, business, but um, at what cost, uh, what human rights are being violated, what ways can we work around it to make sure that we protect the rights, the human rights uh, of communities when it comes to entering mining deals, whatever deals that can be there. Um, in our work, we do it through five strategies. So we do a lot of research. Um, we do a lot of advocacy, advocacy and lobbying, uh, research-based advocacy and lobbying. Uh, we do build a lot of partnerships. So it's a legal, it's an organization that was formed by lawyers. We have different skills that range from ecologists, social scientists, economists, statistician, and everything. But we do not have all the skills. That's why we believe in building partnerships with institutions, with other CSOs, with CBOs, and government. And we also do, where possible and where necessary, we do litigation uh, to protect the communities in natural resource-rich areas. That is Zelai. Well, <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Nobuhle. And thank you so much, guys, for tuning in to the show to get to hear about mining and the issues that uh, relate to women and young people in, in, t in the mining sector and, you know, looking at uh, homes really that benefit uh, from the mining sector as well. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And don't forget to follow Site ZW on our social media, on all our social media platforms and also keep watching watching girl let's talk otherwise from myself not and no chikuni here it's bye for now